Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Woot woot. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. It is so lovely to see y'all. Uh, it is Thursday. It is the day before Friday, before our day of rest. Um, at least if you're in the Bay Area. Uh, if you're in the Bay Area, we can start Friday midday. So, um, you know, if you're if you're someplace where they don't do that, like, definitely try to like, Get that pushed out but you know it's hard right um so first we we have a few people trying to enter the zoom room so uh just a reminder to verify and to get into the zoom room uh you need to send me a message with the email address you have used uh yeah to register for zoom uh so yeah um cool so also, thank you to all the new connections and followers uh, that came to my profile from uh, Daliana. Uh, so it was really fun sharing with her. Um, I know she's released the session on Spotify and iTunes, so I would go check that out. Um, cool. So feel free to, so if you also have questions or topics, feel free to ping that um, in the chats. Uh, it's been a crazy week for some reason. A lot of the ML ops, like ML, there's a lot of ML like related events going on this week. Uh, so last week, uh, Chip had a barbecue, um, little happy hour kind of thing. Um, Tuesday, the yesterday, um, I hung out with some folks from Intuit. Uh, also said hi to a bunch of the Y Labs people uh, who invited me. Uh, to hang out with them. So that was really great. Um, and it, it was fantastic because there were, it's really kind of interesting, you know, when you, when you see, think of topics or areas like ML ops or data ops. Uh, yeah. She also, yeah, yeah. Uh, she also shared some posts on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. So for Mount, cause asking how to get verified for zoom, uh, uh, send, send me a message like on LinkedIn. with the email that you've used to register. Um, morning, Juan. Uh, Poppy Chilo, are you single? Oh, I am not at all single. Not, not the closest thing to single at all. Um, yeah, maybe at some point I'll bring Karthik on to the channel. Uh, partially because we've also, he and I, we've been, so he, um, he works in creative and we've also been very curious about, you know, like how, what are the ways that like models like stable diffusion could be used to like supercharge his work. Right. Um, as a creative, I know he gets, uh, cool. And my uncle, let me just also just doubly check on zoom and then essentially once you're verified on zoom once you're added then you're you're good to go uh yeah so he and i've been talking a lot about um just you know as a designer like does he need to be concerned about automation and like most of his like work uh just being kind of taken over you know and i think this was like a similar we've had several waves of 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 this fear and concern right um it's not unwarranted to a certain degree, but I think where we're at also is, okay, great. You are good, my unk. I'll go ahead and admit you. Um, but I think where we landed was that if he doesn't, uh, you know, yeah, absolutely, my unk. Uh, yeah, so basically if he if he doesn't like find a way to leverage uh technology, um then he's gonna be left behind. But or craves in general, 
right? Not just him. Um, yeah. So, but I will have him on the channel at some point. Uh, mostly so y'all know that he exists. Um, yeah. So, and then today there is like a another happy hour I'm going to, and then after that, then I can uh, I'll get some time to start posting some more content. Um, if y'all haven't seen it, uh, I know when you're first entering like the field of ML ops, it can be a little bit scary and confusing. And also to, you know, courses and books, you know, there's nothing like them. And there's, there's some really good ones out there for sure, uh, in about production ML and ML ops. Right. But I think sometimes too, it can be a little bit of an intimidating field. Uh, so I did put together uh, a blog post of, I think, some kind of really great episodes to listen to, um, especially if you're you're just trying to, like, sort of understand the high-level field of ML ops and production ML. Um, because I've had a few, like, researchers who maybe they don't work specifically in, like, ML, but they use ML as a tool for... Um, uh, protein studies and what have you. Um, and they've said, well, well, like what, what, what is the, the difficulty of production ML? Like, why is it actually hard? And there's a lot of ways to like tackle that question because there's a lot of ways that it's hard. Sometimes the challenge is, um, organizational. Sometimes it's technology. Sometimes it's, um, political uh you know so that's something I'm, I'm interested in like tackling um yeah so talking about content uh hey Tam thank, thank you for pointing that out yeah I did uh put out uh, a series what is ML ops uh on my email newsletter basically what I just try to do is I try to like break down like some of the high level questions and and trends because I think once once people understand that, then it gets much easier to talk about, like, for example, some of the, uh, okay, batch versus streaming, right? That that was a big conversation um, at a couple different meet, a couple different places I've been at. Um, Mark, he, so Mark's a buddy. If y'all don't know him, you know his memes on LinkedIn. He produces a lot of data memes. Um, they're great. And he's an awesome guy. And uh, I think there was a couple that he did where people were arguing about how impactful streaming is really going to be, right? It's hard to understand streaming and batch if you don't kind of already understand the high level processes and like in the follow through, right? So yeah. Um, oh, uh, hey, Curtis. Oh, it's been so long. How you doing? Uh, yeah, and like platforms like GCP have several options uh, available for deploying ML models. How do you decide which one to use and will be future proof? Yeah, and I mean, that's like, I think a really, really big question, right? And it's something that like I think about a lot because also apologies, folks. I had two one and a half Long Island iced teas last night. Um, I typically don't drink because I am a lightweight. So I'll be, you, you'll be seeing me drink a lot of coffee and protein shakes and a lot of water, more so than usual. Um, yeah, so in terms of like actually like future proofing, you're always here, really? You're usually silent? No, don't be silent, Curtis. Say stuff, say all the things. Um, in terms of which one will be future proof. So that's like a very interesting question because so Seattle data guy, uh, he was in the Bay area and he had, uh, his meetup yesterday. It was awesome. Um, God, how many people were there? There must've been at least 60 or 70, I want to say it was a fantastic meetup. I got to meet some new folks. Uh, some people are just recently moved to, uh, the Bay area. Uh, so when I met who he's joining, uh, the DB, like DBT, so kudos to that person. 
Absolutely. Um, and when it came to, to batch and streaming, so basically we were trying to figure out like stream. Okay. So streaming architecture, it has value, right? I don't think anyone's not going to say it doesn't, um, but is it, if you're a company that already does um, batch and ETL, what is the additional value you get from moving to streaming if it's not core to your business? Was I think the question, right? And so I was asking folks, you know, if you had to put hundred dollars and this is a game I like to play, it's kind of similar to like, if you had like, you know, 10 points and you could distribute the points or the dollars, on sort of different concerns or different problems or, you know, different solutions, like how would you allocate that? And for a couple of folks, it's like, you know, if you have hundred dollars, how would you allocate it to different problems and, and where are the different drivers and how, like how much of um, the concerns about streaming and, and companies moving to streaming, do you think is due to a real, real concerns that they're facing? Like if they don't move to streaming, this is going to impact our bottom line, both current and like future economic bottom line uh, versus like, is it FOMO or versus is it more like vendor driven? Um, and a lot of the folks there honestly were like, yeah, we think it's like FOMO and vendor driven. We don't think that, you know, there's, and it, it, there could be a bias, right? I mean, most of the folks there are doing some kind of data engineering, analytics engineering, so a lot of them are also doing a version of like, of uh, kind of streaming where you do like a lot of mini batches. But I think, I, but I think it is kind of interesting, right? Um, and there are implications too for like, for example, how, how people would like retrain models. Um, how would they assess for like bias and risk? Um, a bunch of things are tied into it. So in a lot of ways, it's like backfilling they mentioned was a big problem. Yeah. See how day guys newsletter are like, yeah, I absolutely love reading it too. Um, so it, tying that back to deployment patterns and which one is like future proof. For a lot of people, the biggest concern, right, with like GCP and AWS and Azure is if they adopt an open source tool and then they manage it and then they decide to like get rid of the service. Um, there's a service that GCP said they were sunsetting a short while ago, and it was a product that they were really kind of pushing for more like EDA. And, um, it was geared more towards data analysts, data scientists, right? And so that was at, for a time that was actually like center to like their architectures that they were pushing, and then they were going to sunset it. So I think that is like one of the concerns about using um, like a cloud vendor driven platform um, like GCP or AWS. Uh, I think the second concern in terms of like future proofing is more along the lines of how if, so I was gonna say like, it's if we establish something, for example, like a certain contain as a certain pattern, will we need to then pull it up and then move it to a different pattern? I feel like I don't know I've actually seen that in like certain cloud patterns. Um, so in terms of like, which is the right deployment method, I think what the driver of that decision is, is like in some ways, what is like the, what is the worst possible performance you can kind of take. And then what are the skills that you actually have on your team to deploy the patterns? So for example, deploying something to, what is it? Is it Firebase? I'm trying to figure out which, which one it is. Um, uh, it was like their version of Heroku, both GCP and AWS. I, I can look it up later, right? Like. Um, that takes a lot less engineering know-how than spinning up a bunch of like VMs and then deploying VMs or containers. 
So I think that's also part of the consideration in terms of like patterns, right? Of how to deploy uh, models. But I feel like that, I feel like that's like the kind of the two big questions, it, which is like, what's, what is the worst possible performance we can take? And that includes like, uh, do I, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, let me just finish up this, this little bit. Um, yeah, so for the, what's the worst possible like performance you could kind of take? It's like, will it scale? For example, like if you have like thousands of more users, how does that go? Like, what is the like freshness of the predictions or the data, right? Is it something where, what's a good example? Um, well, it's a good example of batch. Uh, okay, actually, yeah. So one example of batch might be, uh, let's say for example, you're an e-commerce site and you have a bunch of recommendations uh, for clothes or you, or you have some kind of sales or what have you, or, or you're, uh, a retail, whatever. Right. And it, and it's, it's, uh, the holiday season. Um, you could have a choice of running like more personalized targeted campaigns versus like just making sure everyone or certain segments of like a very huge user group, just get like some preset pre-filled email template of like sales going on. Right. Um, yeah. And there's like other things too. Um, I think, I think over at MailChimp, we were, over MailChimp, we're very, we're very boring and vanilla, which is probably why a lot of the stuff works. Um, and like the consideration for when we move to, when, when something is like an ETL that is just like copied into the table and it gets looked up versus like, if something is like a live service is literally just like, what is the, like, what is the entire train? What is the entire transformation like process? How long, it how long does it take? How many um, values or inferences need to be done and then, or need to be returned uh, and whether or not something that's needed immediately, right? Uh, Juan's asking, do I mind commenting on the article? No, you don't need ML ops. You agree with the conclusions. Uh, yeah. I I do. So yeah. So let me let me also link the 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 blog post that I where this kind of popped up real quick. Um. So this is kind of related to the the streaming question. Is is it like a real problem? You know. Um. Another way to look at it is um, who who who's driving most of the the conversation, right? Around uh, ML ops. Uh, okay, so okay, so this is the blog post where I had listed it uh, real quick. Uh, and then, yeah, here it is. Yeah, yeah, so, so I'm gonna do a fall, okay, so I'm gonna do a follow-up collection to this series, or not to the series, but to this one that I, Posted. So this one, I what I wanted to do is I just want to collect. I basically wanted to collect with uh, episodes and blog posts that got at the high level stuff. In terms of critiques, there are a lot more detailed and succinct or detailed critiques of ML ops out there. Uh, so the next one is going to be like, okay, now let's dive deeper. What are some of the challenges? in production ML and all that good stuff. Yeah, and exactly to uh, Danny's point, uh, it is a it was clickbaity. And I also I also agree with the um, approach of like not over engineering things. But it's also really funny coming from from Locke because he was like, I don't I don't remember, remember what his exact title was. I don't think he was like. Uh, he was like Priyanka, who is like lead 
principal developer advocate at Google. I think he was actually on the engineering side of things, but for the longest time, right? Like that was, that was his role. That was how he was incentivized or, you know, he was driven to promote Google's offerings. Right. Um, so yeah. So, Hey Tam, you're saying, uh, your opinion is that you do need MLOps and working in teams, especially large ones. And when you need to do a lot of experiments, whether they are data cleaning process experiments or ML experiments. Um, so what was really interesting was at the Y Labs dinner, uh, there is a fellow who was one of the core contributors to scikit-learn for 10 years. So he, he was there from the ground up and he was asking me, he's like, okay, so what do you define? What's the difference between production ML and ML ops? Right. Um, which I think is a great question. And I think it's, It, it made me kind of wonder how much of, and I mean, my title is like an MLOps engineer, right? But it did make me wonder like, is it a totally separate field that is deserving of its own name or is it, is it something that where it's like the emperor's new clothes kind of thing, right? Where eventually you say it, People well, except for the ending of the Emperor's New Clothes, right? But is it something like that where it's almost like a self fulfilling prophecy where someone creates the label on the lops and then people, you know, jump into it and believe in it and they support it and then they, and then it becomes a thing, right? But I don't think people will disagree that, like, um, Cool, let me just do another check on uh, a Zoom person. Uh, but yeah, I would totally agree. Like I do think that companies could, and teams could improve the way they do uh, production ML. And I think we could definitely learn from it. So I would like 100% agree with that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, just checking up on another person. Yeah, let me check. Uh, list real quick. But yeah, it is really funny because like, yeah, like I think people were basically literally saying, well, I'd be curious to he to understand what people were saying when DevOps came out. Because I think that was two, 2013, maybe 11. So it wasn't super long ago, but it was also like way outside my um, working years, shall we say. Juan, sometimes MLOps can overcomplicate complicate things. Yeah, yeah, no, I hear you. What, it... yeah. And Danny saying, yeah, that's true for everything related to software, not only for MLOps, you have to keep it simple so the solution doesn't end up being the problem. Yeah, yeah. I think all of you all of you have seen that meme, right? Where first you had Docker, then you had Kubernetes, and then you had all the problems that people face there, right? Um, Cool. Uh, you're verified for all future meetings. Uh, but I got some people saying that they are willing to come on as uh, guest speakers and TAs, which is good. So I just need to get the calendar out. Those, get those folks on here. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because like someone had asked the question, they uh, were saying, how do you and like other um, 
like, how do you enable ops engineers decide that you want to go into the field? And it's like, I don't think a lot of us decided we wanted to go into the field. Uh, we had decided we had like decided that like, look, there's there's a certain set of problems we need to solve, but it wasn't it wasn't like three years ago. I was like, okay, yeah, I want to go do this ML ops thing. Um, yeah, Arexio, so many new tools. It's like being a front end dev. I have to say, like, if I had to like do a new like play, if I had to learn a new like web framework, like it feels like every six months. I would just be very upset. Um, I God, I would be so upset. That would that would kill kill my vibe so hard. Um, I guess you could almost say it's like kind of similar to learning Python libraries, but I feel like it's it's nowhere near. Uh, yeah, and Danny, we all get on the hype train and want to implement this and that since there's. A new MLOP still coming out every week, but that's a huge trap you have to avoid. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I mean, like, it's interesting. Like, I want to actually get together. I'm going to get together a group of folks that are doing like the MLM ops like education, like right now, uh, and see kind of what their thoughts are on that because. I don't, like, I don't agree that at, like the way enterprises do ML ops is like right for everyone. And people have been saying this for years, right? Like, don't just do what Google and Amazon does because not everyone is like Google and Amazon size problems. Right. So I think, yeah, at the end of the day, you have to always keep in mind that ML ops is not the tools, but the philosophy. Many people out there believe that knowing the tools means that you own the field or something. Yeah, a hundred percent. And like, I think so in, in a lot of ways, like, I don't think so enterprises that have existing legacy technology in some ways, like they, they probably have it easier in the sense of at a certain point, you kind of had to choose like what works and what kind of, what will plug in because there's just no way to swap out like an entire stack. Right. And even then like swapping out just like one part of the stack or something home bill ends up becoming this huge sort of massive effort. I think the challenge for ML ops is really going to be um, like for individual practitioners, if you're a consultant or uh, you're even soloing, you know, like how do you put together the right stack? You could argue that, well, if you're an individual practitioner already, and you're not willing to drop like 10K on like VMs or, or compute costs or whatnot, in some ways then like your challenge is gonna be um, really big companies, they have like constraints. Individual solo practitioners, they have constraints. People in the middle are definitely gonna be challenged by like the need for like production ML in their applications and services. Um, because even if you get some like really talented engineers, uh, unless you're willing to like keep your product and application constrained and small, which anyone who wants to make money will not, at a certain point, they will try to expand out. Um, they're in this like weird situation where they might not have quite enough resources to go like full hog on cloud. But at the same time, like, for example, the researcher who was like, well, why is production ML hard, right? He's he's viewing it from the perspective of like uh, him and maybe two or three others form like a skunk works team, what have you, right? They identify like a research problem. They just go tackle it. They just build whatever they need to. And that is it. Um, so the companies in between, it's like they might have some really smart engineers. They probably have multiple models. They probably have increasing demand. They also have a roadmap that they want to like go forward on. I think that's the group that's really going to be sort of challenged in terms of um, coming up with a stack, 
uh, figuring out best practices. In part of it, it's going to be like picking up some of the stuff maybe that Google and Amazon is doing, trying it, and then going, oh, this is this is hard. Um, and then looking at kind of how the smaller guys doing go like, okay, like what works first and what works and also what is like, you know, what's not scalable and all that good stuff. Right. I think that group is going to be, they're going to have the most options and they're also going to be a little bit challenged in that regard because it's like such a wide field. But I mean, let me know if y'all like, like agree or, or disagree with that. I'd be kind of like, I'm, I'd be very kind of curious about that. Um, yeah, Rexio, you can't even imagine how it would be like for consultants in the space. Uh, yeah, hold on, totally. Um, hey, Tam saying, yeah, MLOps needs to be built for easier use so that data scientists can access the platforms even faster. Danny, MLOps is a new field and every other field that popped up back in the day will always have doubters because there are always people that are afraid to learn and want to stick with bad old habits. Uh, yeah, Rexio, yeah, you can see them come out when a post on LinkedIn hits a source box. <laughs> Um, uh, hey, Harpreet is in the house. I got to see Harpreet yesterday. It was great. Um, yeah, my brain has just been like not 100% here. I've been on vacation mode. Uh, so like I didn't realize that Harpreet was actually in San Jose the entire time, but it was so good to see him like at, um, at Ben's like happy hour. Uh, yeah, hey, Tammy, you're asking me, have I ever used a TF Extended? You tried to use it to expand a project in your portfolio. I was just going through a brain wreck trying to implement it. Ended up giving up on at the end. Uh, I've used it a little bit. I know a bunch of the data scientists have tried to use it. And that has been one of the challenges of me trying to record. So the Coursera MLOps course, that's been one of the challenges of me trying to, re trying to recommend that course is because I don't know if I love TF extended. And if I don't use something and don't love it, I just don't know if I can really promote it. Uh, yeah, like Danny's saying, TFX is a nice tool, but if you want to use something that's library agnostic and not necessarily attached to TensorFlow, that, that's not the tool to use. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. It's very attached to, to the TF ecosystem. And that was something that I, I but that question of like, should people be teaching like stacks in some ways is kind of related to that. Uh, because on the one hand, you, you do have to be a little bit opinionated to like get across, to do a decent ML ops like workshop. Like you, you do need to have some tools in there. Ideally you want tools that people have used. Um, but that's like very, very opinionated. So I, I yeah. Yeah, it it was a little bit of a of a brain brain fight. Um, yeah, Dang saying already it's a constant fight between you and the decent company because they don't necessarily want to adapt to the new landscape and production ML and they're afraid to learn. Oh yeah, what do you think is um, Do, okay, so do you think that's like all of them or do you think, because something that we are running into with uh, our data scientist is um, they, they, they definitely appreciate when we make their lives easier. They don't think that everything we do makes their lives easier <laughs> is, is like the big thing. Uh, <laughs> like it, it, it's, it's like a trust thing where it's like, if you say, hey, we're gonna make it so that you can deploy your models like faster, you can iterate on it, all that good stuff, and you're gonna have less problems. Um, they they love that, but they're also like, we don't necessarily always believe that you're gonna do that. <laughs> so so I'm kind of curious, like, is it, like, are, are they really that are they really that opposed to expanding their skill set or are they are, are there kind of other concerns going on? Um, yeah, and y'all y'all should definitely be checking out Harpreet's stuff and not just his, his podcast, but also his LinkedIn. Um, because if y'all are very interested in like computer vision, all that, like Harpreet's turning out some great content. Um, 
So I I know her pre like I think you told me right like you were going deep down the rabbit hole on like PyTorch and a bunch of other libraries. Um, hey hey Niels, how's it going? You'd be curious to see if there's an MLOps course where you build everything from scratch, at least in a scoped down way, instead of learning opinionated stacks. It's funny because I'm actually working I'm working on a course like that. Um, yeah, and it, it is a little bit challenging uh, because. I think the biggest challenge in, in creating a course like that is making sure that it doesn't suddenly become um, teaching you the engineering of everything. At least that's like the, the, the challenge I'm kind of running into is figuring out where do I, where do I draw the line in terms of um, education? Do I assume that do I assume that everyone's like a software engineer and they just need to sort of understand the data scientist's point of view and how to sort of, you know, what kind of, what is necessary to have a fruitful and productive collaboration? Or do I assume that um, people are data scientists and they need a little bit of help in understanding like cloud native distributed system design uh, or vice versa? Or, or do they even need to know like a platform? And then the other part too, and this is a, and I'd be kind of curious to hear like what y'all think. Um, in most companies that I know of where they have an ML ops team, it is considered like a platform team. And they're like key stakeholders are not quote, not really building, like they're not building pipelines in like rewriting the pipeline entirely from scratch but what they're doing is that they're writing like the model training to their mo they're writing the model training the feature engineering code the model training code um maybe they add in some like of the monitoring code but a lot of times we just try to like template that and then it's mostly what they're doing is like they might be building like the, the container locally or doing something like that right um in other cases where i feel like i've seen like a machine learning engineering team. It's not like a platform team, but it's almost like they're still building all the pipelines from scratch, like for every use case. And they just haven't found a way to like create the right set of abstractions to actually kind of like make it work. Um, okay, just to scroll down. Uh, oh no, hey Tam. You went right to sleep yesterday because you ended up being exhausted trying to wrap your head around uh, TFX, TFX with all the bugs. Um, he says that like one or two data scientists out of each team is more open to learning, expanding their engineering skills though. Uh, another problem with most data scientists is they don't understand software in general, most likely they're bad programmers as a result, and they don't appreciate good software practices. Uh, you almost need an advocate on each data science team for engineering. Um, we do have in our company, they're the only reasonable people to talk to. Usually these are Emily's and not data scientists for the reasons you mentioned above. Niels, right, like Carl Sagan's need to create a universe to make apple pie. Maybe one way to frame it is giving a tiny peek into what it takes to build, e.g. a data pipeline, uh, DSL. Uh, unpopular opinion, the whole TF library is badly designed from a software perspective. Wow, there are some like hot takes. Well, I don't know if they're hot takes. There's People have takes in the chat. Um, uh, yeah, I mean... Oh God, where do I, where do I begin? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, Neil's like, I like that. I like that approach about giving the tiny peek. Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely an art to, there's definitely an art to education, especially like when the potential skill gap and knowledge gap is like so big. And I almost kind of feel like everyone who has taken like one of those those huge lecture style classes where you have like a hundred to three hundred folks in like a chemistry intro chemistry lecture, and then 
and then they shove people into like the 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 TA office hours afterwards, which this was kind of well how I imagined the office hours, but I think probably just gonna end up being uh guest panelists and then whoever wants to join the Zoom room. Um at this point. Uh I kind of feel like that's how a lot of content education, a lot of content educational resources are sort of written right now. Because if you ask people like, okay, what do you think is like, what do you think is your favorite, like machine learning educational content? What do you think is your favorite ML ops content? I think everyone is going to come up with like, like the same three or four at this point. Right. Um, and I think part of that, and it, like everyone's seen this in like the intro chemistry labs, is like sometimes the uh, the best teacher, sometimes the best researchers do not make the best teachers. Like they are, and same with like the most experienced practitioners. A lot of times, they they don't make for the greatest like communicators because they are just like so far ahead in their careers and in the research that they have no idea what it's like to they, they don't even remember what it was like to be that person that like struggled with git commands right they they went past that a long time ago they from freshman year of college they already understood that there were ways to like work with git that didn't involve like deleting the git file and the repo every single time they they screwed up a command right um so I think that's I think that is like part of it is like there's a lot of like very interesting research and we will when people put it out there, for example, um, putting out like stable diffusion as like a library that could be installed and used or what have you eventually, like as they kind of make their way down, like almost like the OSI model of like ML ops or like ML awareness. Um, I think then you'll get like more, you'll get wider adoption and it's the same with best practices, right? Like if you make it easy for people to do the right thing, ideally at that point, they are doing the right thing. And the people who aren't, you can tell they're just trying to like mess it up for everyone else. Um, if they are like consistently trying to like run up against the grain. Ah, Danny, with the uh, with the uh, the TF library, you just have to go through the source code, only to realize that all the code base is a violation of solid and clean code principles, and that's sad to see. Uh, hey, Tam, saying my opinion for TF, it's like a framework for deep learning, but it's not very Python. Uh, it doesn't really have the same foundation, so it gets really so you really have to customize and debug. It gets really hard to handle in production. Uh, Niels, right, translating implicit knowledge into explicit knowledge and empathize, empathizing with the beginner journey is a skill for sure. Um, hey, Dan, I'm saying plus the TF uh, library needs a lot of learning by heart and you have to mainly use TF tools and you have to wait until a Google team adapts TF to the other library to use them well. And that's my rant. Yeah, it's pretty kind of interesting because like Apple did that same thing with their like, with all their uh, plugs and their um, adapters. They they probably just made a bunch of like drop shippers like really angry, and a bunch of like the uh, factories when they did that. But it's also like a it's a pain in the butt for the user, right? Because I don't want to have to go. I don't know. That's the thing, right? Developers don't like being sold to, and they don't like being taken for a ride. Um, and like every time every time you close a stack like that, I don't know. It's one of these things where it's like you have to provide something that is so absolutely superior to try to close off the ecosystem and to close the stack. And I, when most people would prefer like an open stack, right? But it's also Google. And so they can kind of get away with doing stuff that like, for example, like an open source like Starp can't, right? Because could you imagine if a startup or a mid-sized company basically said, no, no, you could only use our tools with our like ecosystem. And they only have one or two things. Like that would be a that would be a death kill for their ability to like grow. But it's it's cool, right? They can do that. Has a has eight has a AWS done something similar? I don't think so. Oh, well, maybe SageMaker, I guess. Uh 
but I don't know how closed off the rest of their tools are. So that would actually be something very curious uh, that I'd like to see. But yeah, if y'all just want to rant some more, like I love it. I love hearing all the rants. Um, Rashmi, I sometimes do projects using Git and Python and attend an interview where I'm asked questions related to some functions or commands I don't know about. Yeah, that. Interviews could be better uh in data science and ml i'm kind of curious danny like how do y'all like conduct interviews right now like do you do uh like a tech screen with like a system design like a panel or whatnot because over at mailchimp we do um Yeah, I'm saying no sage makers and it's not as closed off. It's a platform you can use, but it's not really a library. Um, yeah, because the way we do interviews is we do uh, so we do like a culture slash values, like soft screen interview, and then we do like a system design. And honestly, it's pretty like, like, I don't want to say it's easy or simple, um, but it's straightforward which is like we give you a prompt and then you basically will um ask us a bunch of questions we'll give you some more information which you can choose to do something with and you can either choose to use you can use choose to let it influence your design and then you explain your reasoning and all this good stuff um but we try to kind of we we try not to do the facebook style interviews for one thing, um, like MailChimp isn't Facebook or any of the big tech companies. So we, we just could not afford to like, first off, we can't afford to chase away really great candidates. And for me personally, I also refuse to do tech screens now. I will not do them. It is an absolute waste of my time. Uh, ooh, hey, Tam, you're currently suffering with cover letters in your search internship. Yeah, that. Ooh. Yeah, I don't do cover letters anymore too. I haven't done that in years. Uh, yeah, those are two things I, two things I don't do. I do, okay, actually, let me phrase this, three things, kind of, sort of. Uh, I don't do cover letters, I don't do tech screens, and I don't do um, take home. I use far because I don't want, I don't want to like, I don't want to feed the trolls and the monsters. I don't want to continue that system. Um, but yeah, so I mean, like, yeah, that's pretty tricky, like Rashmi and like, hey, Tam, I think it, it, it gets better, honestly, once you get your first uh, one or two, quote unquote, like serious, like engineering or data science gigs, it, it does get better. Because at that point, well, actually, like Rashmi, I'd be kind of curious, like, what kind of interviews are you doing? Um, but yeah, hey, Tam, I have to say, like, undergrad is rough. Interviewing as an undergrad is really, really rough. Um, and internships are competitive too. Um, yeah, I know when we were doing interviews for internships, like we had a lot of great candidates through the, through the door and I'm like, oh my God, they would, they would wipe the floor with me so hard right now. Um, no, Danny, don't apologize for the hot takes. I love them. Please, like, continue to do the hot takes because you know what. What's really interesting is uh, if you are to talk to people outside of like LinkedIn, uh, you know, like one on one, uh, most people probably would agree with your hot takes. You know, so you have like you have a welcome community out here. Uh, but yeah, 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 catch you at the next one. Um, I'm super excited for some of the guests that are going to like show up in October and I'll go ahead and announce them uh, when they're more settled and then ask plenty of hot take questions. I might have to actually like preface that, which is like, hey, guys, if you want to come to the show, be ready for like hot take questions. People love those. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, but we'll we'll catch up the next time you're on. Uh, let's see. And then, uh, okay, so he was saying that we don't have pair coding or anything like that or a whiteboard related approach, but our technical task requires some understanding of different skill sets from software design to TDD to MLOps. Okay, interesting. I know with Cora for one interview they had they wanted me to like debug a code base and to make it better. And it was like an ML training like platform code base or something. And Curtis uh, is saying, uh, you've been asked a lot of questions regarding designing a system to integrate ML, like an ML system, oh, to integrate an ML model. Gotcha. Okay, so so you're being asked to like design a platform that can integrate like many models and like what tools would you use? Yeah, I think that's pretty, I don't know how common that is. I, I know most companies do some version of like a system design interview. Some choose to design, some choose to ask a person to design a pipeline. I think if it's more of an MLE role, if it's more ML ops, I think some of them kind of do like a pipeline, uh, whereas others do like, here is the requirements for a pipeline, but design or cobble together tools for a platform. And like, what would you use and why? And the tricky, the tricky thing is that it's very tempting to sometimes lean on, uh, yeah, hey Tam, go ahead, send me the, send me the resume for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, feel free to send me the, um, the resume on, on LinkedIn and I'll go ahead and review for you. Uh, yeah, Rashmi, uh, you're mainly doing interviews for data scientist engineer roles. You're graduate in data analytics engineering. Got you, got you. Yeah, I think. Well, it depends. Like, what what kind like what kinds of questions are they asking you? Uh, Rashmi, can I send my resume to where I send? Yeah, send it on LinkedIn. Um, let me go ahead and link my profile real quick. Cool. Yeah, feel free both of you to uh, go ahead and send it. Uh, yeah, and for folks who have sent me messages about getting verified, um, I will get you checked in, check, checked out, and then uh, you'll be good for all future sessions. So when you try to join, what I do is I compare your name against the verified guest list that I keep, uh, and then I'll I'll admit you from the wait room. Right now, it's actually kind of chill. Um, this will be a lot more important to get pre-verified uh, when we start having guests, because when we have guests, if you're not on that verified list you're like not getting in right but the goal is you can directly ask some questions uh you can send me questions for them ahead of time and all that good stuff um is sean hey mickey i'm a fresher and haven't achieved any internships yet can you review my yes yeah go ahead sean just send it over um uh paul hey paul how's it going um when you're interviewing for ml engineer positions do you ask to explain previous ml projects they have worked on before and if so where are the best projects you've encountered and why uh yes we do but yeah there so there's two places where okay actually three places there's three places where uh candidates are asked about prior work including projects and uh, the first place is with the hiring manager call. So we do something like recruiter call, hiring manager call, uh, soft skills. And then there's like the soft skills, culture values, like, you know, uh, partner interview. And then there is like a partner system design interview. And then usually like candidates will find out whether or not they get an offer. Like sometimes within like a period of, of a one or two days. So we, at least like over at MailChimp, we have a pretty tight turnaround. Um, it just really depends on when people get their scorecards in. So they can, we can ask them about their prior like work history and projects. 
in the hiring manager call, in the soft skills panel call, where we ask a lot of questions about, for example, uh, you know, was like communication is a big one um, about setting deadlines and expectations and what could go wrong or what has gone wrong. And then with the system des design, a lot of times people will tend to default to projects they've already done that they really like. And then we'll basically like ask some questions like, well, why do you like this tool? Why do you like that? Um, so we, we definitely get at it in a bunch of different ways. Um, in terms of the best project, this is where the requirements for, I think, so I think there's like two two kind of questions or, or things to consider is like, if you consider, is like, if someone considers an ML engineer as like a full stack data scientist, then best project could be, could be influenced by the, for example, were they doing something new and innovative, right? With a recently released model um, or library. But if we're interviewing them for more of like a platform team role, uh, what we typically want to hear and what we think makes for like a really good project is first off, if, if they like struggled with scale is a big one. And how did they handle that? Did they like try out a new tool? Did they um, have to re-architect some legacy code? All that good stuff. Um, we also like to hear about projects that, or like platforms or tooling where they had to maintain multiple models and pipelines. That's another thing we really like to hear. Um, we also want to hear about learning experiences, like maybe they did something, they broke a production system, and then like, how did they learn from it? Um, a lot of times, like it, we've had some candidates who basically they say they, like we've had at least a couple candidates where they said that they'd never broken anything. And that's actually not a good answer or response. It's not a good look. Or let's say for example, um, we asked them, the big one with like machine learning pipelines is we asked them like, okay, how did you, did you do retraining? Um, how did you like monitor the performance? Um, how, how did you test the code in the model, right? So in that regard, the best projects are, are when they can provide like really great meaty answers for like all of those questions. Um, in terms of like the actual, like once again, like did they do like a super cool, like, you know, computer vision, like recommender project and all that, like that's great. But I think a lot of times when we're, try to like figure out people to add to the team. We're looking at more at like engineering rigor as opposed to like, what are the newest, greatest like libraries you're um, exposed to, right? Uh, do, 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 do. Let's see, there's another couple of folks. Uh, okay, uh, do, do, do. Oh wait, hey, uh, Alex uh, is trying to join the wait room. Uh, if you haven't already, be sure to verify with me. Let me just check to see if you've already done that. No, okay. Uh, okay, so Alex, uh, if you can hear me, I know you're trying to join the Zoom room. Um, make sure to send me your email address that you've used to register with the Zoom room um, so you can like verify it with me. Um, yeah, so I know that was a very long response, Paul, to the question, um, but I hope that answers it. And I, I do think like there's a different, like there is a little bit of a challenge because, because like some roles are more of like, um, like applied like scientist roles versus like pure like SWE roles. So for the applied scientist role, I think what they're gonna be looking for is is definitely different from like the SWE roles, right? Um, oh, Rashmi, you're saying you get asked about your projects and sometimes based on the skills technologies mentioned on my resume, you get asked about questions about the company team, about questions that the company team works on on a daily basis that I don't use much. 
Uh, Diksha, you're saying, uh, you were asked the same in your interview. Uh, oh, that's not true. Wait, what was that in reference to? About like no one screwing up? It's always interesting when people say that because, uh, so it's so like speaking from like the hiring manager slash like hiring board approach or um, not hiring board. Um, sorry, let me just once again message folks. Uh, hey, send me your email address on LinkedIn to be to be verified for future sessions. Um. Yeah, yeah. When people say that, I think. Part of it too is also as a candidate, like you, I, I, and as as someone who has been a candidate many, many times, I totally get it. Like there is, and there's an art to like positioning one's screw ups in such a way that it's like valuable, right? Hey, Abhishek, good morning, good morning. Uh, yeah, sorry, just like a quick shout out to the folks who are in the chats. Uh, we've got Diksha, we've got Abhishek, we've got uh, uh, Razvan, uh, we have got uh, Rashmi, Ishan, uh, we've got Hey Tam, uh, we've got the full, we had Danny earlier, uh, Curtis might still be here, uh, we have Niels, Arexio, uh, Harpreet, yeah. It's a full party in here. It's an absolute full party. Yeah, okay. So basically as a, like when I interview a candidate, right? Uh, you're still here? Yeah. Woot woot. Um, yeah, Curtis, we're gonna have to make it over. I was talking, I was asking Kenji when we're gonna do the next uh, like like gathering of folks. And he said at some point he wants he wants to do an international one. And I think you and um, are you're over in London, right? Who else is over in London? There's someone else, I think, right? Hey, Tam, like like saying I've messed up so much in production that I know every bug possible on Earth in ML Ops in production. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So they're they're okay. Like okay about the art of so in interviews. I'm going to drop some, I'm going to say some stuff. We'll just run with it. Okay. So the pragmatic engineer, he has this great video about confessions of a big tech hiring manager. Uh, yeah. Richmond is in North London. Okay. Yes. So uh, yeah. Ken was saying we got to do something international. Um, yeah. And I, I would love to do that. Um, but if y'all haven't checked that video out, please do. It's pragmatic engineers confessions from a big tech manager. Uh, oh, Andrew Jones is in London too. Oh, that's awesome. Very, very cool. Excellent. Uh, cool. Okay. So as a hiring manager, if, okay, or, or, or as an interviewer, right? When I am asking uh, questions about scenarios or soft skills or what have you, um, it's not that I, I am not necessarily asking to hear your screw ups. What I am asking is one, okay, so if you tell me you have never screwed up, what that tells me is that you have never been in a position or you have never worked on a project where you were challenging your existing skill set. Another thing that could also potentially indicate is uh, your manager, your team lead never want to put you in a position where you were growing. Right. So that's why saying I have never screwed up is like, not a good thing, right? Because what that's saying to the interviewer is you, you've never actually like stretched yourself. And that's that's what we want to hear. We want to hear that people are growing, that they're constantly um, improving, that they're, um, you know, they're, they're to a certain degree like unafraid to take on a little bit of risk, 
Uh, now, the art of this, though, is we don't necessarily want to hear that you brought the that you you brought down the production database like twenty times. That is also not good because it says you didn't learn. It says you didn't learn from your mistakes, right? So the art of the scenario story based, you know, they have the uh, was it the star framework. They have a bunch of ways that you can you have a template that you can you know plug and play your situation. But it's the setup is, you know, I ran into this problem. It was either caused by me or it was caused by a teammate or whatever. In this, and also in the retelling, be sure not to blame your teammates. That also doesn't look good, right? We want to see people take accountability for their actions. And also, too, you don't, it, there's this thing of like the blameless culture, right? Uh, if you Google search like a blameless engineering culture, that's a big thing, right? And it's similar to this idea if, if someone could bring down a production database like 20 times, that is not the individual uh, fault, but it is like not putting in the systems to make sure that doesn't happen, right? Um, so you you state the problem, you state what was your sort of participation in the problem, uh, how did you come up with the solution, and then what was the takeaway that you got? Like, so for example, if it was, I checked in code that brought down our front end. Uh, the problem was that currently we were in a high growth, you know, high growth phase. We, um, our engineering team was growing and we were still experimenting with new processes. And sometimes we would uh, note that these were problems, but then, you know, we, we as a team didn't always get to it. So one day, you know, it was like getting to the end of the quarter, we wanted to push in some some new features uh, before we like did a, a code freeze. And for a lot of retail companies, they do this. They will do a, a like um, a code freeze during the holiday season because that is their like busiest revenue making season. So they don't want to do that. So a lot of companies will basically say you stop pushing stop pushing code like in uh, November or whatever, right? Maybe bef a month before that. So we wanted to push in a bunch of stuff and. Uh, you know, something along the lines of well, what, what, what could be a problem? Uh, maybe like we had tests, uh, we had CI CD, but a new version or whatever, like, okay, like just imagine it, right? Like, so this thing happened, and or maybe it's like I accidentally deleted, uh, I accidentally deleted some files for testing, or I deleted Jenkins file or whatever, and then it didn't get through. Uh, then we discovered either a bug went to the system or the feature that I promised would get pushed out, didn't get pushed out, didn't get a notification. Okay, great. So that's a big problem or what have you. So how'd you solve it? You know, I like put the files back in place or whatever, and then, um, and then moved on. So the res, so how did you solve it? Right. We also don't want to hear, okay, you had this problem and then you just didn't do anything about it, right? We never want to hear that. Um, so ideally you resolved that situation. We did have a candidate who they basically said like there was three or four problems and we're like, okay, so how did you solve it? And they're like, well, we solved it or they solved it. It's like, so you never actually went in to try to take accountability to try to push forward a solution, right? Um, but maybe like your solution is, okay, I, uh, as part of like the pre-commit hooks, uh, it checked whether or not it had these files, right? Implement that, um, you know, you did a post-mortem or you like talked about your learnings in the Slack channel. Uh, you asked, hey, like as a group, could we implement like code reviews? And then you started doing that for folks, right? So like, if you think of the story, I know I made it very rambly, you obviously don't want to do that, but yeah, like there's plenty of frameworks, star, you name it. Um, but what we want to see is like, you tried something new or uh, in, a situation like came up, uh, you figured out a solution to it or, or you didn't, you struggled with it. And then what did you take away from the experience that now you implement in the future, right? So if you're going through this thing, if you like, for example, bring down the production database multiple times, you didn't learn, right? 
Uh, so that's how you want to think about it. So some companies like in teams, they will ding you. Um, they, there are, there are some like malfunctioning teams out there where if you screw up, they're going to be like, oh, well, yeah, you know, that was like a major, like that was such a, that was like such a noob move. You don't want to join those teams anyway. Right. Like, like you got, you got to look out for number one and you are number one in your life. No one's going to care, but no one's going to care more about your career than you are. Right. And part of that means also not joining teams that are clearly have issues like that. Um, yeah. Like I had an interview in the last round or so. But here's the other part too, right. Is a, a team of, of high performers or if you have a, a group of people, also don't join teams because you like individual people on that team. Because if the team or the organization is not functioning and healthy, those high performers, they will leave. So I interviewed for this one role uh, when I was making the move from data science to like, like MLN slash ML ops, right? Uh, I had a couple different offers. Um, I had three offers and I had a, a few others that were like late stage or I was kind of waiting to hear on them. And then there was others that were like mid stage. Right. And these are all companies, by the way, that I refused to do tech screens for, and they were cool with it or a tech screen was not part of the process. So those companies do exist out there as long as you don't go for the big techs. Um, but this one company I'd interviewed for, uh, one of the interviewers, like he was so cool. I mean, he's, he's, he is still cool. Right. And he ended up leaving like six months later. And then the other two interviewers that, all, that were on that panel, this is for an ML platform team interview, right? Uh, one of them was the director. I had asked him, hey, like, what is your, what is your plan or your, how do you ensure like a candid success? Right, in the first like 30, 60 days. Part of it too was because they had an insanely complicated cloud situation. Um, they were supporting multiple cloud vendors, including uh, GCP, AWS, and uh, Ali, Alibaba Cloud, um, because they had a, a Chinese marketplace presence, right? So in my head, I'm like, okay, if you're basically saying we're going to be on a team where we have to support three cloud environments for the ML team, like, what's your, what is your plan to make sure like I don't die? And he was like, oh yeah, it's like you know, sink or swim, and it's like, oh. Right. So I'm not joining your company. Um, and then another interviewer was, he was going to be the, the, the tech leader, the team lead. And he basically just kept on interrupting me. And he like, he, he just like dragged me over the coals because I couldn't explain or write out in depth the implementation for, um, uh, scikit-learns like random forest regression model uh, uh, yeah reinforced Russian yeah, yeah yeah like he 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 was like okay can you like write down the code and explain also something like uh, uh no um I can tell you how I would use it I can kind of tell you the situations where it's maybe not appropriate I can kind of tell you the different performance metrics I'd look at I can tell you how to test it all this good stuff but I can't actually like explain like I can't write out the steps of the algorithm, which honestly, maybe that makes me like a terrible engineer and data scientist. I'm willing to admit it to y'alls. Um, and it was just like the full hour where he was just basically calling me like an idiot. That was really hard. <laughs> and then I talked to the director and then, uh, and then they, they, uh, gave, they, they gave me an offer. Right. And it was funny because like, at that point, I, I kind of knew they were going to come in higher, but in my head, I was like, okay, uh, if this other company that I really liked comes in within X, you know, percent, right? Like if they're only off by like X percent, then I'm going to go with this other company. And then that's ended up what happening. Um, like the recruiter for that company was amazing. That one person in the interview was amazing. And he's doing great. He is, he is, he is doing his thing. 
Um, you know, and after, and after that was like, I don't know, that experience has like really made me really think about like, what do I, what do I expect for, from candidates? And also what do I expect from like future, like interviewers, I guess. Uh, yeah. I mean, so that's the thing, right? Like, so if you're interviewing for a team and you like one or two people on that team, but you're kind of, you're, you're getting red flags about everything else. Don't join the team. Cause I guarantee you like those really great performers or those people that you really like, they are going to leave bees in a market, like, like what it is right now. That's like really hot. Like, the other part too, right, is like the number of opportunities you get as like, not just like a high performer, right? When I say high performer, I don't just mean someone who's an amazing engineer, right? Because value can be, you can give value in many different ways, right? Um, sometimes you can, you can be the engineer who maybe you don't do like the big, huge projects, but maybe you pick up tickets like whenever like people need help. Or maybe you're the engineer who is uh, constantly like checking in with the team. You are like planning the sprints. You are doing X, Y, Z, right? Tons of ways to give value. Um, so if you're a high performer in that regard, where you are constantly giving value to the people around you, um, maybe you are great with like empathy. So maybe for example, when you are an ML platform team and you're working with data scientists, either because you, you've had a, experience you have a data science background or what have you uh let's say you're really good at like distilling down what are the essential user stories what are the requirements for the platform that uh or the tools they need to be providing right um that kind of value isn't it is incredibly important and all those people uh they have outsized opportunities when it comes to jobs and recruiters it's not like a one-to-one -one, like if you are I don't know, right? Like it doesn't scale linearly. Like the top, however many percent will get like the lion's share of like recruiters taking them up. And if that's not to say that people can't get jobs or whatever. Like I think of myself as frankly being very mediocre. Yes, I can say that with confidence. I think I'm very mediocre in a lot of ways. Um, you know, but even then, like I, I still occasionally have opportunities that I can consider right so yeah so that whole thing is to say like if you're when you're looking at your career and like interviews and like teams and companies like just kind of really focus in on on you like what are the bottlenecks to the skills that you the problems you're currently working on focus on those focus on your projects uh focus on like having a really great relationship and like emotional impact wherever you go and you like, you'll be good, right? But yeah, some of these like spot, like the spot checking questions really annoy me a whole lot, especially if it's something that could be Google searched. Like to me, that is like an absolute waste of time, both for the candidate and for the interviewer. And I think like, as an, like as an interviewer, like we always need to be asking ourselves, like what kind of signal are we hoping to like get from this? And if we are constantly, if for, for example, if we're constantly calling back candidates to like do interviews, that means like we didn't do our job as like, as a hiring board. So that's another red flag too, to me, honestly, is like, let's say for example, the recruiter said, oh yeah, you're, you're only going to do like four interviews or whatever with like the hiring, like recruiter call, hiring manager call, um, uh, soft skills project, and then tech skills, system design, right? To me, that actually seems very fair because if you think about it, like the recruiter call is usually about 20 minutes. Hiring manager might be one. Soft skills might be another one hour. And then tech screens another hour with no take home. To me, that feels very fair in a lot of situations because you're realistically only spending about three and a half hours. If you do a little bit of extra preparation, you know, it might be four and a half, but the preparation you do for that interview you could amortize it to like other interviewers too, other interviews too, right? Um, so if a recruiter says, okay, you're you're only gonna do these and you get called back for one, sometimes that's okay. 
But if you get called back for, if they're like, no, no, we still need another one. Like I would, I, I'm not going to say I would say no, depending on what your personal financial situation is and all that good stuff. I'm not going to say don't do those interviews, but when they do that, what's actually going on is uh, one, like the interviewers were not coordinated through the process. Or number two, they actually have an offer out to another candidate or there's another candidate and they're like trying to see which one of you they, they sort of want. So at that point, it kind of just makes sense to be like, you know, say like, hey, what are the questions that you need me to answer? Am I happy to happy to do it over email? Um, or even just to like not go with it. Like if you have the opportunity. Um, yeah, so I, I would say, but you know, interviewers are not, we're also not perfect, right? A lot of times what ends up happening with interviews and I've talked to friends like other companies, uh, sometimes that's just a requirement of working at that company. It's like you do so many like X number of like interview hours. Other times too, the interviewers are, um, sometimes they're the people that are building out the team. Those are, those can be very valuable, I think. Um, and then other times it's, uh, whichever engineers they feel they can spare to kind of do it. And then you have like back-to-back -back interviews where you just have to like put in the scorecard, you maybe review the resume ahead of time, and then you just kind of run with it. Um, so that was something that also like stuck out in the pragmatic engineer interview is just because you didn't get an offer or progress in that interview. It's kind of like the, um, it's like that statistic where they're like 85 to 90% of like models don't make it. Uh, if you're like coming up with that ratio based off of the number of models that like get started, probably the reason all those like models don't make it is because they're actually not great models, right? Like some models you actually just don't want to put in production. And that's totally normal. It's like, how working as a data analyst, like I would create these reports and dashboard and dashboards and these analyses that were used like one time. And then that was it. Like the purpose of that report or dashboard was to support like a single decision, or it was to serve as an input to a, an executive leader that was like sourcing multiple inputs for a decision, right? Is that like, is like, is that dashboard report a failure? No, it, it helped them out. Right, so why would I determine the success of like, or the value of what is being produced from the team based off the number of reports or dashboards that like stick around, right? Um, same with models, same with the interviewing hiring panels, right? Just because you don't get the offer for that job doesn't mean that one, they won't get back to you. And two, it doesn't mean it was like a good fit either. Like it's really possible that like you kind of need that rejection to, to get to the thing that like actually mattered. Because like, there was like two or three, or was it? There's two times in my career where um, I was laid off and it took me three or four months to find a job. And I like, I knew I wanted to do a certain type of work. Uh, so for example, when I was moving from working as a data analyst to data scientist, like I knew, I'm like, I want a data scientist gig. And I kept on getting uh, interviews for uh, Salesforce gigs because that's what I had done um, like as a growth hacker and whatever was I done a lot of like Salesforce, email marketing, a lot of lead gen, a lot of whatever. And I could have taken it, but I knew I wanted like a different kind of gig. So, you know, I kept like hustling and grinding on that. Right. But everyone's, everyone's situation is different. Um, yeah, Dick just saying like a new move. We hear that a lot while gaming. Yeah. Oh, hey, Tam, you're saying to be honest, like sometimes you don't feel like you're contributing when working with a lot of like high performers since they're at so high a level. By the way, what is the tech screen you talked about so much? Ah, okay. Yeah, let me explain what that is. Uh, okay, so in a tech screen, basically uh, data structures and algorithms leak code interview is, is what I'm referring to. Uh, tech screens can tap, can, kind of be a lot more than that, to be honest. So for example, uh, it might not just be a data structures and algorithms interview. Sometimes they might also have like sample data 
and maybe you know they want you to like come up i think the really like fun ones and by fun i mean like not so fun are the ones where they're like yeah come up with like write like an entire future engineering and model training code um if if they're okay with like it being like super easy and janky then that, that's totally fine because then it's like okay we'll just you know like i don't know um right like import favorite you know data munging library an import like i don't know simplest model right xg boost random force whatever do a little tuning loop for now do your train test split like you know that's that's okay but if they want something that's like really robust then i'm like ah oh, that's not cool um but yeah that's what a text screen is a lot of times it's the leak code, but sometimes they will provide sample data or they'll do some kind of like mocking of a scenario and then they want you to provide a technical solution to it. Different from a whiteboard system design interview. Whiteboard, whiteboard system design interview is like, we wanna do a multi-model multi -model pipeline. Um, we uh, actually, yeah, here, here's one I, I, I remember. Uh, we're an e-commerce platform. Uh, we want to help people who are buying clothes. Uh, we have these three different user segments. We have uh, people who are using the web app. We have people who are using the mobile app and who are uh, have something in the cart. And then we have people who are like located close to the store or whatever, right? And it's like, okay, figure uh, what is the, the system that you would use to then, uh, first off, like, what are, like, what are the, um, what? it was a badly written one too. So I actually had to rewrite the uh, case study for them, which was pretty funny. Um, they were asking like, what were the deployment options? Uh, how would you uh, stack the models into like a pipeline? Like what is what what model like what would be uh, separate versus what could draw from like the same source, um, and then what are like some of the concerns? What tools would you use? That one they made it like a take home with uh, a live walkthrough, and it, it was it's also something where like it's kind of not free work because it was more just testing to see like okay like do you know what tools you're using do you know what you need to be looking for because ultimately they're like whatever tool you recommend you're probably going to be using something different like because we have we have our stack right so ultimately you're just going to be using whatever our stack is and maybe you might add one or two things two tools but um yeah, what needs to be retrained? What would be better as a batch um, uh, ETL versus uh, what would need to be a, like a live service? Um, all that good stuff. So that's typically what the system design looks like, but in a much lighter weight. Uh, Paul, uh, you're not terrible for not knowing how to code every algorithm from scratch off the top of your head. I think that's a toxic way to view potential candidates. It also instills unrealistic expectations for people trying to break in. Yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah, 100% agree with all that. Uh, oh, shoot, uh, Hashim, uh, I missed the message from you. If someone is looking to pursue a master's and use that to break into MLOps, what would you suggest any specific programs or institutes? Um, I, okay. I don't know. Oof. Okay, so this is like really kind of tricky because first off, there aren't any programs, there, there aren't any master's degrees that focus on like MLOps or production ML. You have like master's degrees that are uh, like computer science uh, masters. Uh, and for those, you can choose a special, a lot of times you can choose like some courses, but I, I don't, See, see, the problem is you're asking someone who only has a bachelor's. Like, I don't actually have any like advanced degrees, and I think the challenge a lot of times with production ML is, or, or, or software in general, 
is it's, it's not just about understanding uh, data structures and algorithms. There's a lot more that goes into being successful as an engineer. And that goes double for like production mill, right? So for example, if you're much more, so if you're really interested in the research route, then a master's can be good or some kind of advanced degree where you focus on that research topic. But that's really only if you're interested in it. I, I don't know how much I personally would advocate going for a master's specifically to get a job in ML ops. I think I would focus more on like, what's the kind of work that you want to be doing? Uh, what's your bottleneck? Like what, where, where are the current skills or experiences you're lacking? And then I would, um, and then from there, I would then determine what is the most feasible route. Cause the other part too, right? Like to consider, let's say for example, you're, you're halfway through your master's degree and then you get a job offer. Are you going to be continuing with it? Uh, so that's like something to think about. Like, so I, yeah, it's like people are saying um, in the chat, like, so I did a boot camp, right? To jump from data analyst to data scientist. Um, because for me, like a, a master's, which is like out of the question, like there is not a single master's degree that would take me. It sucks. I'm over it. Uh, but like, so for me, I was like, okay, how do I kind of make understanding that like a uh, advanced degree is not really on my path? How can I kind of like make the best of the opportunities? So I do personally feel like there are a lot of opportunities out there that don't require masters. I also probably did a lot of things that are sort of not super linear. Like, so for example, I worked on, like I, I, I did hackathons. I worked on projects uh, during the weekend. Uh, I worked on early stage startups, um, took workshops, uh, networked a bit, all that good stuff. So all that kind of helped me out. Uh, quick, yeah, quick shout out to uh, folks in the hangout. Uh, hello there, uh, is it Chi? Chi Reviews. Hey, 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 how's it going? Um, oh, hey, Tam mentioned that uh, they sent out, okay, for the ZenML uh, ML Ops Hackathon, they sent out the four judges, uh, Charles Fry, uh, Anthony Goldblum, Chipoyan, and Goku Mahandes. And for uh, folks who don't know who those are, uh, so Goku Mahandes, he created the Made with ML site, which is awesome, is a is a fantastic educational resource, especially if you're trying to break into ML Ops and ML Engineering. It is text-based and it's got good code samples. Uh, we've got Chip Hillian designing ML systems. That book is on the way. I haven't received, I haven't gotten it yet, uh, but it's on the way. Um, she also taught, uh, she was a, a ML engineer at Snorkel. And then she went on to teach uh, courses at Stanford. I think she still has that course going at Stanford, uh, wrote the book, Designing ML Systems. And then uh, she has her, her startup Claypot AI. Uh, Anthony Goldblum, I believe was a co-founder of Kaggle. And Charles Fry is uh, leading the full stack deep learning current iteration of the course. So yeah, so those are uh, absolutely great examples. Uh, hey, Tim, saying this reminds me of the my thing about the whole interviews. This reminds me of some companies that give you interview assignments that take a lot of time to outsource some of their work for free. So shameless. Yeah, like I, 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 I definitely hate it when companies do that. Luckily, that that company was not trying to do that. But yeah, like it, it is very uncool. It is very, very uncool. Um, Diksha, you're saying you have a master's degree in information systems, but bootcamp and building projects helped me more. Yeah. Rosmont, you're saying, me personally, I don't like tech challenges because I feel like they don't actually monitor the true skill. I went to almost 30 interviews while already having an ML job just to test the market. Nice. Love it. That's the way to do it. 
the best time is inter- to, the best time to interview is when you have a job. Uh, I feel like the current hiring process is kind of outdated because it expects you to know every small detail when in reality, every engineer Google stuff to solve a problem. Um, Kai, uh, she reviews, I have a degree in Nigeria, but I need to go back to school here in California. Uh, now I'm not working here in California. I only do YouTube. Uh, Rosamond, that's like so serious. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree with you. And that's the thing, so like, so like Dixie, you're saying you have a master's degree in information systems. Like, I, I feel like it's useful. I think graduate degrees are very useful if you're like studying an area that's a little bit more foundational as opposed to something that's like the new hotness, like MLOps. Like I like for example, like what are principles and best practice, like what are principles and best practices in MLOps that you can't really find in like DevOps or just like so or like SWE. Right. Like that to me is kind of the question of like, where, where, what is the distinguishing point or where are like the distinguishing characteristics of MLOps? And, and that's something I'm still trying to figure out for myself, right? In my head, it's really about how do you facilitate like production ML? And I think, and like, Dan, uh, let's see. And I think Danny and Ronald, right? Like we were uh, having this discussion before, right? Like like is DevOps just an extension, like is MLOps just an extension of DevOps or is it its own, it's, its own thing, right? Cause it's clearly not just DevOps, but what is like, what is actually like the, the gap? And also what's the practical impl- Im- implications of that too, right? Uh, so I think once some of those practices have solidified, then it'll be like a lot easier for people to like create content, create cor- courses, all this other stuff. Um, yeah, because I think right now the challenge, I, uh, let's see, some of the challenges that we ran into, I think, uh, was software engineers that didn't understand the ML lifecycle and data scientists and ML folks who didn't understand distributed system distributed systems and um, deploying and serving. Uh, Diksha, there's no retraining approach in DevOps as opposed to MLOps. It depends on how closely you tie retraining to like CICD, right? A lot, of, a lot of folks like when they. There's two ways I've seen people handle retraining outside of like Qflow, like if they if they if they don't have Qflow or something else, right? And it's either like scheduled by like an Airflow job or um, or they like try to like plug and play into like an existing like CI/CD pipeline. So I think that is one challenge. Uh, oh. Niels is saying, in my opinion, one of the key differences between DevOps and MLOps is ladder deals with functions that are learned from data. Instability introduced by real world data is harder to handle than straight up code. Yeah, like total, yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. And I guess I wonder like at what's at what point does the best practice then become like codified into like a discipline? Right. But yeah, that's funny. That that was yeah. The other, the other part that I'm still also playing around in my head too is like, what is like the, uh, what is like the, the daily life cycle versus the ML life cycle. If you have both of those present in a single team or org, how do those interact, and how do you, as an individual data engineer or an ML engineer or ML ops engineer? Like, what is like the scope of responsibility and like who owns what, right? And to a certain extent also to like, what are the skills that are transferable versus like, what are the skills that like belong to like that domain? Of course, these these are questions that maybe don't have actually any practical implication. Um, But that to me is like really kind of curious because 
like a lot of the folks I spend time with, right, are data engineers. Most of their use cases or the business partners they're serving tend to be more of like the analytics crowd. But like when you're serving data to like ML folks or ML applications, that I think becomes something that's like a little bit more challenging. Um, especially when you think about, especially with regards to that like instability introduced by like real world data, right? To me, it's kind of curious. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear y'all's like, what you think are some of the other like distinguishing character, like distinguishing character characteristics between like ML ops versus DevOps that are like belong to ML ops, but not DevOps, right? So I'd be kind of curious about that. Uh, oh, hey Tim, I think you were gonna like post the link, right? For like registering for the ZenML competition. Let me go ahead and do that. Let me go see, let me see if I can go find it. Uh... But I, but yeah, I'd also be curious um, to hear from y'all's folks if you've worked in an org that uh, had both a data science, like like a, a data science ML group that like needed data, as well as like a data platform team that served data to like all their analytics teams. Like how like how did that work? Oh, you already posted it. Oh, you know what? Okay, hey Tam, you know what happened? I think I probably, I think what I might have done was because people were sending bad stuff via link, I might have actually turned off that ability to do that in live chat. Maybe I think that's what happened. Apologies about that, dude. Yeah, yeah, that's, oh, the fun stuff, right? Like being a female and trying to like put together an office hour. Some people like to just like, you know, let it all hang out. Some people like to send weird links. So yeah, apologies about that. Um, but thank you for making people aware and for doing that reminder. Um, and uh, just a reminder, because someone did ask this in the uh, earlier, uh, I am not single, so please don't ask and uh, please don't hit on me. So yeah, uh, cool. I am, I am just here to facilitate great conversations in MLOps. That, that is what I am here for. Uh, but yeah, so folks, if you are looking for hackathons to dig into, uh, I would say, especially for for like ML, like ML opsy production ML, ML hackathons, uh, you know, you've got two coming up, the Zen ML one, and then you've also got one that's being posted in the ML ops community with uh, Redis and Saturn, Saturn Cloud. And this is Demetrius's MLOps community. So keep your eyes out, open for that. Um, yeah, and I think I posted a site too. I'll repost it at some point. There was a site that I posted in the last session where uh, they actually will link all the cattle competitions and competitions from other sites uh, in like a single place where you can see those. Um, yeah, Rashmi, I hope I, I like I hope it's helpful. And once again, you know, I'm I'm cool slash okay and all that, but I am more excited for, for some of the guests that are showing up. Um yeah, once I get them scheduled. So that'll be cool. Um let me know if there are specific questions that you would like me to ask them. And I will do that. And wow, it's like 10. Uh 
I didn't realize I went 20 minutes over. And yeah. But you know what? When you're having fun with folks, like it's crazy. It's crazy. I didn't realize it was 20 minutes over. Okay. So I am going to uh, close this down. Uh, let me just first do a quick check on any lingering questions. Uh, do, 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 do. And I, I appreciate, hey, hey Tam, you're great. All of you are great. I appreciate the kind words. Uh, yeah. Oof. Man, but so far it's actually been okay. But like, oof. Yeah. Some some people like Tina. Tina's got 300,000 subscribers, I think. I've, I've seen some of the comments that she gets. And I'm like, wow, that's crazy. It's what's weird is that people like are willing to put their names to it and say stuff in public as if you can't Google search it. Uh, yeah, but it was great seeing everyone. Um, once again, I will announce the guests a week ahead of time. We'll gather the questions and then make sure to verify with me. If you're not verified, if you are not on the verified list, uh, you will not get in. And I want all of you to like be a part of the combos. Uh, but yeah, see you, everyone. Have a very blessed week uh, and let's go into the weekend and let's make it awesome.